upon this Thursday edition of Newsline at noon, Islamic State sets a new deadline for a possible hostage prisoner swap Thursday sunset. Now, this according to a new audio message purportedly released by the militant group. As senior diplomats from South Korea and the U.S. meet in Seoul for talks on North Korea policy, a U.S. research institute says there are signs North Korea is restarting its Yongbyon nuclear reactor. Plus, the U.S. Federal Reserve decides to keep its rate near zero and says it will stay patient in starting to normalize its monetary policy. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. It's noon Thursday, January 29th here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in. Live from Seoul, I'm Oh Jin Ju. It's very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this afternoon, a purported message from Islamic State is demanding a failed Iraqi suicide bomber be taken to the Turkish border by sunset Thursday or the Jordanian pilot it is holding will be executed. Meanwhile, the fate of Japanese hostage Kenshi Koto remains unclear as Japan works closely with the Jordanian government for a safe release. Kim Jian reports. Islamic State militants have set a new deadline for swapping Iraqi prisoner Sajida al-Rashawi for a captured Jordanian pilot. A message allegedly from IS says al-Rashawi should be delivered to the Turkish border by sunset on Thursday. It says the Jordanian hostage will be executed immediately if Jordan does not hand her over by the new deadline. Jordanian state TV quoted government spokesman Mohammed al Mumani as saying Amman is willing to make the exchange. The Jordanian government spokesperson said it is ready to free Sajid al Rishawi if First Lieutenant al Kasabi is safely released from IS captivity. Bomani said the release of the pilot, who comes from a prominent family in Jordan, is important to the monarchy. But the exchange would go against Ahmad's policy of not negotiating with extremists and could potentially set a new president. Amid the crossroads, the father of the pilot demanded the government secure his son's swift release. Jordanians should push their government to protect the life of their son or otherwise your king is the one who killed him and his stubbornness. You have to know that my son will not be the last soldier or Jordanian citizen who will be sacrificed. The Jordanian pilot was captured in northern Syria in December when his F-16 fell from the sky. Sajida al-Rashawi has been behind bars for over a decade for attempting a suicide bomb attack in Jordan. There was no mention of the Japanese hostage Kenji Koto in the new offer, also being held by Islamic State. Tokyo says it's working closely with Jordan for Koto's release. Kim Jong, Arirang News. And it's been confirmed that no Koreans were killed in the deadly attack on a luxury hotel in the Libyan capital, Tripoli, which left at least 10 dead, including five foreigners. The Korean embassy in Tripoli told Yonap News on Thursday that the five foreign casualties were one U.S. citizen, one French national and three people from Kazakhstan. There have been reports that one Korean national had been killed in the attack. Militants loyal to Islamic State have claimed responsibility uh, for the events earlier this week. An affiliate of IS released photos of two suicide bombers whom it said carried out the attack. Two gunmen burst into the five-star hotel on Tuesday and set off a car bomb in the parking lot. Now, to a development that, if true, could ratchet up tensions on the Korean peninsula, North Korea appears to be trying to restart its main nuclear bomb fuel reactor after a five-month shutdown. Connie Kim reports. After nearly half a year of supposed inactivity, North Korea may have restarted operating its main nuclear reactor. Satellite imagery posted on the 38 North website shows hot water draining from a pipe at the 5-megawatt Yongbyon reactor and snow melting on the roof of the reactor and turbine buildings, possible signals that efforts to restart it are taking place inside. The U.S. Korea Institute at Johns Hopkins University, which runs 38 North, 
says the developments were observed over a two-week period from December 24th to January 11th. It stresses, however, that it's too early to determine what exactly is happening at the reactor. This latest development comes as the two Koreas have been making overtures toward holding inter-Korean talks. On the other hand, U.S.-North Korea relations are frosty over North Korea's alleged cyber attack on Sony Pictures. Experts say that while suspicious, the latest activity at the reactor could be fairly innocuous. It's hard to tell. The activities could be linked to simple maintenance procedures preparing for the summertime. However, if the Yongbyon reactor is being restarted, I think it'd be a means to pressure the U.S. more than South Korea. The Yongbyon nuclear reactor is closely watched as it's where Pyongyang produces its weapons-grade plutonium. Adding to concerns, North Korea is thought to have made progress on its ballistic missile technology. Just recently, in its defense white paper, Seoul said the North had taken big steps toward making nuclear warheads small enough to fit on ballistic missiles. Connie Kim, Arirang News. A visiting U.S. official has reiterated the United States has the same policy as South Korea when it comes to North Korea. Following talks with South Korea's first vice foreign minister Cho Tae-yong on Thursday, U.S. Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs Wendy Sherman said the first shared priority of the two allies is denuclearizing the North. She said all parties of the six-party nuclear talks, aside from North Korea, are working together to see what more they can do to engage Pyongyang. The multilateral dialogue involving the two Koreas, the U.S., China, Japan and Russia has been stalled for more than six years now. The U.S. official, however, refused to lay out the specific steps the North must take to show its sincerity for denuclearization. Turning now to a revelation by former President Lee Myung-bak, the previous South Korean leader says that in mid-2010, North Korea offered to hold an inter-Korean summit and issue an apology over the deadly torpedo attack on a South Korean warship if Seoul gave it half a million tons of rice. Hwang Jae has the details. Former South Korean President Lee Myung-bak has shed light on previously hidden history between the end of 2009 to early 2011. He says Pyongyang asked for 500,000 tons of rice in July 2010 in return for inter-Korean talks and its apology for the Cheonan warship sinking. This came in an extract reported by Seoul-based Yeonam News Agency on Thursday ahead of the official release of his 800-page memoir on his presidency. The former president said he refused the offer because it would have been under Pyongyang's terms and he was not comfortable with it. He added the North's planned statement on the Cheonan warship sinking would have been a general apology, not an acceptance of its responsibility. He also said he strongly pressured then-Chinese President Hu Jintao during a G20 meeting in June 2010 to enforce international sanctions against Pyongyang after the deadly sinking. On his highly controversial river restoration project, he pointed to other major government projects that faced criticism at the time but were evaluated to be successful by future generations. The Four Rivers Project, a signature project of the former leader, has long been under fire over alleged shady construction deals and the irreversible damage it has done to local ecosystems. His book called President's Time is set to hit shelves next Monday. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. South Korean and U.S. defense officials plan to hold a second round of annual cybersecurity talks in Washington in the coming months. The two allies launched a consultative body called the Cyber Cooperation Working Group back in 2013 and held their first meeting in Seoul last February. At the second meeting, the officials are expected to focus on how to better manage cyber attacks originating from North Korea and strengthening their information sharing networks. The working group will analyze the weak points of the two countries' response capabilities to any form of cyber attack. This meeting follows Pyongyang's alleged cyber attack on Sonia Pictures back in November. Now, inter-Korean relations might have not have been the uh, best in 2014, but trade between South and North Korea still managed to reach a record high last year. Now, basically all the volume was sh shipped through a land route linked to the inter-Korean industrial complex in the north border town of Kaesong. 
Shin Se-min reports. Could this be a bright sign for the two Korea's future relations? The Korea International Trade Association said on Wednesday, inter-Korean trade volume topped $2.3 billion in 2014, more than double the figure from the year before. The cumulative trade volume over the past 26 years is $22 billion. Inter-Korean trade dropped to an eight-year low in 2013, the year Pyongyang shut down the jointly run Kaesong Industrial Complex, citing heightened tensions on the peninsula. It resumed operations there five months later. The products from the complex account for almost all inter-Korean trade. The recent jump in trade volume could get an extra boost from a recently concluded free trade pact between Seoul and Beijing, as the two sides agreed to acknowledge Kaesong products as being South Korean in origin. Manufacturers who invest in the Kaesong complex will gain a competitive edge, as their labor costs will be lower than those in China. But obstacles to the stable growth of inter-Korean trade remain, with bilateral tensions a major concern. North Korea added a new clause in September last year that allows it to detain South Korean businessmen if they do not comply with a contract or fail to make agreed payments. Pyongyang held South Korean businessmen when it shut down the complex in April 2013, saying they had outstanding bills. Another challenge will be expanding the capacity of the factories within the complex. Seoul banned facilities investment in the joint complex after the sinking of Chan'an warship in 2010. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea. Connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ah Jin Ju. Even when I'm Ah Jin Ju, marketing researcher, strategy analytics, said Thursday that LG Electronics brought in about. The U.S. Federal Reserve has reiterated that it will remain patient in determining when it when to raise interest rates, citing the country's unusually low inflation. However, it did say the U.S. economy is expanding at a solid pace. Kim, Ji, Kim Min Ji reports. The Federal Reserve signaled its plans to raise its key interest rates sometime later this year. At the end of a two-day policy meeting in Washington on Wednesday, the U.S. Central Bank said it will be patient when determining the appropriate time to boost interest rates. What's worth noting here is the change in wording from when it said it would keep the rate unchanged for a considerable time. The Fed said that the U.S. economy was growing at a solid pace, citing improved labor market conditions with strong job gains and a lower unemployment rate. The central bank also said the declines in energy costs had boosted the purchasing power of households and inflation has declined below the committee's longer-run objective. As for when it would lift the rates from the current zero to quarter percent range, the Fed said that it would take into account a wide range of information, including measures of labor market conditions, inflation expectations and ratings on financial and international developments. The central the bank has kept interest rates low to stimulate the U.S. economy in the wake of the financial crisis. Analysts estimate a rate hike as early as June. Kim min Arirang News. Samsung Electronics managed to recover from its third quarter earnings shock last year thanks to its chip sales, which hit a four-year high last quarter. Song ji -sen has the details. It may now be safe to say that Samsung has rebounded from its earnings shock in the third quarter of last year. Samsung Electronics has released the final figures for its fourth quarter earnings, with an operating profit of $4.9 billion, up 30 percent from the previous quarter. That's a 36 percent decrease from the same quarter a year earlier, but the fall is smaller than the 49 percent on-year drop in the third quarter as Samsung's chip businesses reported strong sales. Memory chips have become Samsung's biggest profit driver in the third quarter, overtaking handsets, and now account for more than half of the company's profit at $2.5 billion. Profit for the mobile division plummeted to just $1.8 billion from 2013's $5 billion as the competition got fears for the Korean handsome maker in both high- and low-end smartphones. For all of 2014, 
Samsung logged $190 billion in total sales, down 10 percent from 2013. Samsung's final Q4 figures come just days after its rival Apple announced a record net income of $18 billion from the same period, nearly four times higher than that of Samsung's. Analysts forecast a modest recovery for the company this year on the back of demand for its memory chips and processors from its rival smartphone makers. Samsung also followed other Korean firms in committing to pay higher dividends to its shareholders by raising the amount by nearly 40 percent from a year earlier to $18 per share. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. Now, when investors think of emerging markets worth putting money into, many still think of Brazil, Russia, India, and China, also known as the BRIC group. But some analysts suggest now is the time to look beyond those nations. So what are some of the options most favored by Korean companies? Our Lee ji has the answer. Apart from the BRIC countries, which do you think is the most promising emerging market this year? The Korea International Trade Association asked some 540 Korean companies this question, and the answer is Vietnam. In fact, most of the countries ranked high on the list were Southeast Asian countries, namely Indonesia, Thailand, and Malaysia. The top 15 nations also include Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and Poland. What's noticeable about these countries is their demographics. The Trade Association says young people between the ages of 15 and 24 make up a big portion of the population of those top 15 countries. This means they have a lot of room to grow, as these are the people who will lead future production and consumption. This is perhaps why more than half of the Korean firms surveyed say they are considering making inroads into those markets. As for the top choice, Vietnam, its economic growth last year hovered above the global average at 5.6% and is forecast to continue that momentum this year. The most volatile variable for Hanoi is crude oil prices. As an oil exporting country, falling crude prices will hurt its GDP, but Vietnamese officials say it will also help bring down the country's high inflation rate. But no matter what the case, experts warn that those wishing to enter these emerging markets, including Vietnam, will have to vigorously monitor the market conditions and utilize free trade agreements as these countries often come with high risks. Lee Jun, Arirang News. Now, no signs yet that Korea's unemployment blues are getting any better. In fact, it seems they are getting worse. Figures show the youth jobless rate in Seoul breached the 10% mark for the first time ever last year. According to a new report by the Seoul Metropolitan Government, the number of unemployed people between the ages of 15 and 29 stood at 100,000 in 2014. That's up well over 20% from the previous year. That's the highest it's been since the city began collecting related data in the year 2000. The overall number of unemployed in Seoul also spiked 15 per cent last year from a year earlier to a record high of slightly over 240,000. Koreans' love for coffee is showing in the record amount of coffee imports last year. The nation's customs service and the coffee industry said on Thursday that nearly 140,000 tonnes of coffee beans and coffee powder were imported in 2014. That's the highest amount since 2011. Now, if you convert that into its value, that adds up to some uh, 595 million US dollars worth of coffee up over 18 percent from the previous year. The jump is attributed to the lower cost of coffee beans from the U.S. after the Korea-U.S. free trade agreement came into effect in 2012. The coffee industry says Koreans' growing desire for a cup of coffee following a meal also played a role. Now, people with autism have a very difficult time adapting to uh, society and other people as they lack certain social and communication skills. But now, local researchers here in Korea may have found the key to developing a new treatment for the disorder by pinpointing the main cause. Uh, Son Jung-in has more. This child has been diagnosed with autism. His mother rattles a toy to try and engage with him, but he does not react and continues to play by himself. He seems to be in his own world with little need for social interaction. 
Until now, the treatment for autism was limited to physical therapy to reduce the repetitive behavior associated with the disorder. But recently, a group of local researchers identified a protein called IRSP53 that could be the main cause of the social impairment in people with disorders such as autism or schizophrenia. Here, in this experiment, one mouse approaches another mouse without hesitating. The mouse without the protein shows no interest in the other one and carries on with its own activity. The researchers found that something called an excitatory NMDA receptor is overactive in mice that don't have the protein, causing social and communication impairments. Scientists hope the discovery will lead to an effective treatment for similar disorders. It is important for the NMDA receptor to function normally, because it is when this receptor is functioning at a level that's too low or too high that problems arise. Knowing the receptor's status could help doctors prescribe the right medication. The results of the study were featured in the renowned scientific journal Nature Neuroscience. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Now it's that time of the newscast where we look through the rest of the global headlines we're following this hour from Seoul. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim, standing by for us at the news center. Eunice, there are concerns of renewed tensions in the Middle East after new violence along the Lebanese border left three people dead. That's right, Jinju, and we are talking about tensions between Israel and Hezbollah, which had mostly subsided since their month-long war back in 2006, that is, until recently. And in this latest escalation, two Israeli soldiers and one Spanish UN peacekeeper were killed after Hezbollah sent anti-tank missiles across the southern Lebanese border and Israel returned fire. The disputed area borders Lebanon, Israel and Syria. The UN's strongly condemn the death of its staff member while urging maximum restraint, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu promised the attackers would pay the full price. Hezbollah said the strike was retaliation for an Israeli airstrike over the Syrian Golan Heights 10 days ago that had killed six of its fighters. Turning now to Greece, new Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras chaired his first cabinet meeting on Wednesday, and he said his government had a clear mission ahead of them. We did not come here to take over institutions and to enjoy the trappings of power. We have come to radically change the way in which politics and governance is carried out in this country. In a move to reassure voters that they would follow through with campaign pledges to revise its $270 billion bailout program, the new left-leaning government put a halt on all privatization plans that were a part of the country's bailout deal and hiked up minimum wage by 10%. Prime Minister Tsipras also said Greece would not default on its debts to get into mutually destructive clash. New Finance Minister Yanis Varoufakis is set to meet with Eurogroup's chief this week and also hold meetings with his Italian and French counterparts. This as ratings agency Standard & Poor's said it has put Greece on watch for a potential downgrade. And finally, the sale of drones is seeing a surge in recent months. Forbes magazine reports eBay alone has sold more than 127,000 pieces of the unmanned aerial vehicle since March of last year. That is a transaction worth $16.6 .6 million. It was also a popular Christmas gift as drone sales saw a five-fold increase during the American Thanksgiving and Christmas period from six months earlier. Earlier. Drones made news earlier this week after one crash landed on the grounds of the White House, which a spokesman later confirmed had posed no threat.
Well, today will be a wet day for the southern provinces, and the rain over Jeollado and Gyeongsangdo provinces is turning into snow. So Jeollado and Gyeongsangdo provinces could see up to eight centimeters of heavy snowfall, while other regions could see one to five centimeters of accumulation. In the meantime, Seoul and the surrounding areas will have a mostly cloudy skies. Now, the daytime highs will be slightly higher today, but it will feel as chilly or chillier than yesterday because of the clouds hanging in the sky and with that in mind let's take a closer look at the readings for other regions daytime high in Daegu and Gwangju will rise to six and four while Busan top out at seven this afternoon and as for the other regions Jeju Island and Daejeon should see a high of eight and four and Tokdo gets up to three now it seems like we'll wrap up January on the cold conditions with a temperature at freezing expected on Saturday morning with a low of minus seven so stay warm that's all for the weather have a wonderful rest of the day thank you jim for the weather update and that brings us to the end of this edition of newsline at noon yes join jinju and i at the same time on friday until then goodbye